So naturally, festivities for the great event began several days ahead of time. Haywood Hale Brune reports. Now that Mom's apple pie, once the ad man's American apotheosis, is likely to come from a freezer, the holiday parade with its floats and Graustarkian band uniforms is probably our most typical national activity. This Indianapolis one glorifies the internal combustion engine. The automobile is America's magic carpet. And on Memorial Day weekend, the family rugs, romantically named for predators and disasters of nature, are fanning out across the countryside. Some of these drivers, wearing imaginary helmets and coveralls, are heading for the sprawling ribbon of the Indianapolis Speedway, past show windows decorated by clerks who dream of seeing a checkered flag surrounded not by candy, but by cheers. In Gasoline Alley, where the cars are tuned, one can almost reach out and touch the dream. Many of the dreamers are laden with enough decals to create a wind resistance problem. This familiar commercial figure is suddenly a feverish mechanic again. Where's our restaurant? Oblivious of the crowds, wearing a Florentine assortment of liveries, those of a host of mechanical causes grabbing at the coattails of glory. At the pre-race driver's meeting, Chief Steward Harlan Fengler gets a damp weather twinge from a collarbone he cracked as a driver in the 1924 race and lectures the racers on protocol. If the pits are blocked, there will be a rotating amber light on the end of the wall there as you come into the pits. A flagman will be upstream by that crossover to warn you. If you have to come into the pits, if you're out of fuel, well, then you'll have to make the best of it. Predictably, the daredevils respond to cautions as spring day schoolboys respond to lists of dates. And the principal enthusiasm at the meeting is reserved for those speedsters of the cosmic track the astronauts who helped to make Indianapolis a temporary capital of glamour. After the brassy overture, however, the center of the stage today belonged to the cars and drivers, moving slowly for the only time as they were pushed into position. The armor of a race driver seems a frail hope when one considers the ratio of speed against the thickness of the carapace, but in a game of risks, one skips no precautions. Encouraged by three previous wins was A.J. Foyt, while Al Unser could take comfort at the fastest trials, the pole position. Start your engine! Unser led 32 cars into the parade lap, a lot of metal worth just under a million at that moment, largely to be of interest to scrap dealers in about three hours. When the flag sent the field away, the roar rose like a Viking war cry at the charge, and the cars trembled with the power they barely could contain. Johnny Rutherford saw the light of victory for a moment as he cut across at the first turn, briefly to take the lead, and so did Unser, who reached for power and found enough to go right back on top. Unser's car, number two, was suspended all but 14 of the 200 laps as hair to these mechanical hounds, but he rarely got far enough away to miss the snarl of pursuit. Principal snarler was Foyt's number seven, which hung on as grimly as a mountie, actually held a brief lead. Unser always found the extra miles hidden in his machinery, however, and was aided by a pit crew which performed like muscular watchmakers to send him quickly back into action. For reasons like this, two-thirds of the cars didn't finish, while near the end, terror leaped like flaming gasoline as Roger McCluskey hit the wall and then got hit by Ronnie, Ronnie Bucknam. Neither man was hurt, but the cars were suddenly free-form sculpture, while the field, facing a wall of flame, took to the grass like so many bewildered bulls determined that nothing should stop their charge. The caution flag stopped a new speed record. All pursuit shaken off, Unser rolled across the line at a restrained 150-odd miles an hour and then drove into the hysterical arms of Victory Lane, extended to him as they had been to his brother Bobby two years ago. The long day had earned him something around $200,000, and all its tensions were soothed away by that thought, the embrace of a garland, and the oddly boyish traditional drink of milk. This is Haywood Hale Brune in Indianapolis. And next, a traditional drink of milk.